Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Glenn. Um, uh, I'm from Melbourne uh, in Australia, which I think is um, actually the furthest place on the earth from here. Um, so I, I decided to come for a few weeks and get settled into Europe first. Um, my talk is called Friendly and More Powerful, and it's uh, actually a bit different to talks um, I've done before. So um, I guess let's hope it goes well. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself with a bit more detail than you care about, probably. Um, I'm 31. I've been working uh, professionally for um, nine years. And I actually got my first sort of senior job uh, about five years ago, so more than half of my career, I suppose, at this point. Um, I've only doing, been doing front end for two years professionally, but uh, I've been doing software engineering for a lot longer. Um, and I came across this quote by Douglas Adams in an interview. He says, I think I'm quite good at remembering how strange things are when you first come across them. If I have to explain something to someone, I'm usually quite good at it, because I can remember what it was like not to understand it, and how strange and bewildering it looked. And he goes on to say that most people, when they try to explain something, usually do a bad job of it, because they've forgotten all the things they didn't know at the time. And that's me. I forget that sort of thing all the time. And it occurred to me, when I started building the web, I knew a lot about software. But what's it like today to be new? Because when I started, I knew the terminal back to front. I knew Unix. I knew how to Google for something and get a decent response. Um, I knew that MDN was wonderful and the best thing on the internet, and W3 Schools is a toilet. Um, there's a lot of other stuff about um, uh, web development and, and software development and HTTP that I knew. Um, and I think as an industry and as individuals, we often forget just how much we already know, um, how much implicit knowledge we require. We know that we're learning new stuff all the time, but we forget that anyone new to this, there's a huge amount that they have to learn to catch up with us. So I came across this tweet again last year, uh, which I thought was quite brilliant by a Twitter account called I Am Developer. Um, and it's sarcastic, but it's not entirely untrue, um, that there are a lot of steps if you're trying to do a basic website um, these days. And so I thought, you know, for the purposes of this talk, let's hypothesize a couple of different people. Um, the first is the professional, which is all of us in this room. We wear our sunglasses when we code, of course. Uh, and the second is the newcomer, someone who doesn't have our experience and they're terrified. Everything is new information, and it's very difficult to make sense of. Um, now, if you don't consider yourself a professional, then you can pick someone that has a lot more experience than you. Um, and if you, have, you know, can't remember what it was like to be a newcomer, think of maybe, I don't know, a friend who doesn't work in the industry but would probably be good at tech if they tried, or a, a teenager, a relative, somebody that might want to start learning. So for the professional, let's tell his or her story. Starting a basic website in 2015. I'm saying 2015 now, because things move on. First step is install Node.js, but of course, we all use IOJS now, of course. Uh, version 2 just came out. Everyone submitted a joke logo to that GitHub issue. There's nice, you know, like, cool little club of IOJS people, right? The second is install Bower, but we're so past Bower now, right? I mean, I don't even know if Webpack works with it. I mean, it, it, Almost certainly does, but I don't care. Um, the third step, picking a CSS framework. And this is great, because everyone's got their own. Everyone's been building this perfect thing that's going to solve all CSS. Um, but you haven't actually you know, tried it on anyone else's site, but you're, you're convinced that it's going to be perfect. Um, picking a responsive approach. Now everyone has their own. I use a thing called MetaQuery. Um, it, it, like, this is another decision you have to make, but it's just one more. Uh, in this line. And then eventually you get to step 47 and you have to write some HTML. And you're like, well, I'm, you know, I'm a bit past HTML. I use JSX and a React component hierarchy. You know, it's totally OK. And it's weird because every one of those steps in that joke is actually more complex in reality for a professional or the, the kind of snooty professional that I'm pretending to be. Uh, whereas the newcomer's experience is vastly different, right? Given the same set of instructions, the first thing is install Node.js. And the question is, well, hang on, 
what, why would I need JavaScript on my computer? Isn't it already running in the browser? Isn't the whole point? The only reason we use JavaScript is because it runs in a browser and it's you know, all ready to go. And the second thing is install Bower, and it's like, well, hang on, you just got through telling me that NPM is where all these things live. Um, what, what's Bower? Why do I need another one of these? And the third, and this can be the worst, because it's like, OK, cool, I'm going to pick a CSS framework. But what if I pick wrong? Like, last time I picked Bootstrap, and people made fun of me. Because people in tech are jerks, right? <laughs> and like, so can I change it down the road? And the answer is kind of no. So there's a lot of anxiety about that first decision, if that's what you think you have to do at that time. And then you pick the responsive approach. And it's like, cool, I've read about this. I know something. The, fun, the first time where, you, 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 where, where somebody might feel like they have the answer to this. Now, of course, it's a lot more complex than they think, but it's kind of the problem. And then at step 47, it's like now they get to do the thing they started out trying to do. And people, I like to think that people who can become really, really great web programmers maybe need to learn with a bit less time than I did when I was a teenager. Like, if we make people go through all of this stuff, then we're going to select for people who have that time. And what I think we want is people who, to get involved in the web in small ways and become excited by it. So I'm going to tell a different story, which is the old story, right? which is the simple version. Because telling someone there's only three files you need to worry about, they're all different languages, you can read up about them and put them in a directory and just go for it. That gives them some power, right? That's enough to be dangerous. And that's exciting for people, right? We've been telling people to do that for a long time, but we've missed all this stuff. We know the stuff they can't do. We know that they can't have more than one JavaScript file unless they have a whole lot of script tags. They can't communicate without polluting global scope. Dependencies are a nightmare. There's no minimization. I mean, CSS, there's no uh, processing at all. You can't use auto prefixer. I don't even know how you build websites without auto prefixer. Um, if you're telling a newcomer to CSS that there's a function called darken, and it's like, you've got this color and you want to darken it by 10%, that's the most useful, simple thing that they could do. But it's not in CSS, it's in SAS. So it presupposes a certain level of processing. The question is, does any of that matter? And no. To that person, in that moment, it doesn't. And I'm going to take a slightly higher level view and quote uh, a friend of mine, Alex Fayeki, from a talk he gave in Australia last year, where he talks about the web being split into the consumer web and the professional web. And the professional web is what we're all here to talk about. It's open source driven. Um, you deploy it wherever you like. It's the old, open, uh, free web. The consumer web is something new, which is people who only have used the internet on a device like an iPhone or an iPad. So they've never used a device that can create the web. They can post to Facebook, but they can't. They, they have no conception that the web is open and available for them to publish their own things on. Now, the problem with the professional web, while it might be technically open, it's of, often culturally closed and quite hostile to newcomers. So he go, goes on to say that he'd much rather turn the professional web into a producer web something that's culturally and socially accessible, welcoming, and truly open to all of any skill level, of any language, of any gender. And I think that is really worth striving for, because the more people we can show that the web is an amazing place that they can contribute to, the healthier the web becomes. And so this is how I'd like to um, attack that problem, which is to get people inspired by what they can do. So I'm going to borrow a concept from Why the Lucky Stiff and the Ruby community which is, if you know how the browser works, it doesn't matter what job you do day to day. There's probably something that you could publish into a website or share in a link to a colleague where you could fetch some data, visualize it, transform it, with a little bit of programming knowledge and this incredible, incredibly powerful browser that everybody's just got installed in their machine. Um, you can be incredibly effective. So I'm a few minutes in, and so I'm going to stop talking in abstract and start talking about some concrete things. The first is these sites like CodePen and JSBin. People 
can jump on and, and edit files and understand the interaction of HTML and CSS. I give that four sparkly hearts. Now, the sparkly heart is the most powerful emoji heart, I think we all understand. So that's quite a big rating, right? The thing I like most about these things is the fact that there are people online who are quite brilliant and do incredible work. These are just three that I particularly like. Um, they do absolutely incredible work, and they validate those platforms as being capable of those things. And I think that's really important, because being able to view somebody's source and, 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 and read through what's being executed is the most important thing on the web. Those sites, when somebody does something incredible on those sites, it, it's saying, you might not understand this. I mean, half the things I don't understand. But there are no secrets there. Eventually, you'll be able to read every line and understand them, and you can come to understand it. I think that's really reassuring for somebody when they don't know. At least they know the extent of what they don't know. But my 10 Sparkly Heart Award goes to a thing called JSPM, which is a new project that I'm going to spend pretty much the rest of the talk talking about, because I think it contributes to this goal really, really effectively. But before I do that, I have to talk a little bit about JavaScript. So this is my emoji for JavaScript, which is the throwing of in the bin. That's how I feel about JavaScript most of the time. Um, JavaScript is awful. I mean, it has no module system. right? Um, everything's async, and the only way to do async stuff is callbacks. Uh, there are no data structures of, of any real use. The OO is, is brutal. Um, you can shoot yourself in the foot very easily, and then you have to worry about browser incompatibilities. And just, I mean, we all use it all the time, and we forget how hostile it is. But if you're looking at a code example where the point of the exercise is to understand what a regex does, the Ruby case in the top line is readable up until the regex. It's very easy to, even if you understand the mechanics, you can follow the, the thing and then you go, OK, this new thing, this is the thing I have to learn. Whereas JavaScript is just a mess. I, I mean, it's hard, even with that syntax highlighting, it's hard to see where the regex is, which is pretty damning. But if there's one thing that makes JavaScript really bad, it's that Stack Overflow and most of the resources that you can find out there are out of date. They're full of like really good performance tips that were good at the time, browsing compatibilities that are no longer relevant, um, you know, be best practices and rules of thumb that are just waiting to be found by somebody who doesn't understand um, Googling for something and being led astray. Um, it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit sad. So that's how I feel about JavaScript. Like, as, as a learning, like, previously I'm like, don't teach anyone JavaScript. Just get rid of it. But that's not JavaScript anymore, right? It's ES6. I mean, we saw um, Axel up here uh, yesterday afternoon talking about all this stuff. And I think ES6 is actually a much bigger shift than, than we've given it credit for. F the, for the first, if it was just this, it's easy to recognize. You can tell if you're looking at ES6 code because it's got the word ES6. Hey, this is the ES6 solution. Or it's got a fat arrow, or it's got class, or it's got import. Right? And because it's new, all of the examples are using modern APIs, generally. Then there's all this stuff that's actually just friendlier, like having classes is really friendly. String interpolation, this binding, promises. The fact that it's only available through polyfills like Babel is huge. You don't have to worry about browser inconsistencies. You only have one target. It's also more powerful. I mean, modules, right? Actual module system, blessed by a standard. I know there's debate whether it's good enough, but it's good. Um, and it is good enough. And real maps and set classes. So I think ES6 is incredibly important. But I started this talk by saying it's not fair to, um, to tell people that they have to run a preprocessor first. It's too much up front. It doesn't give them a chance. So I'm going to demonstrate how JSPM solves that. But I want to talk about this idea of incremental complexity. So the idea, I think, what we should strive for, and JSPM is part of the way there, but we have a lot to do, is if we can build our tools so that as you learn one more thing, you can do one more thing. And then you learn one more thing, and you can do one more thing. There's no point where you get to a step, and it's like, now you have to learn 10 things to do the next thing. And there's no point where it's like, now you have to forget 10 things 
to do the next thing. So with that in mind, I'm going to play a screencast, pretend I'm live coding, um, of somebody creating a first website. Right? They, they open a file. Um, they uh, just drag it into, they make a directory and they drag it into Sublime. It's pretty easy. Right? It's pretty easy to make a new file there and then say save, index.html, nothing bad. Sublime has this nice little shortcut to generate a HTML file. That's nice. Um, and then you know the first tag, h1, pretty easy. Now, if you want to load this in a browser, the old way would be double-click on the index.html file. But we all know that that will not allow you to do everything in the future. So uh, there's a product called Anvil, which is free. And it lets you just click, add a directory, and then it'll serve it under a .dev address. So you have a full-on web server, and you didn't, um, didn't run a command line. Uh, you didn't install Node. You didn't do anything. Right? And so that, I think, is that's the first step. Instead of using CodePen to learn about HTML, now you've got a file in your file system. So that's what's the next step, right? And we all know how easy it would be to just run a simple JavaScript file at this point. But what about ES6? Well, JSPM hosts a version of System.js, which is a loader, which will compile everything for you. It's basically like Babel that runs in a browser. So I can import a local file using tilde, and then say, import main, and now I write ES6. And that's it. Now I can learn ES6 syntax, and I can use string interpolation. And I just I didn't have to know that there was another version of JavaScript, except to know what answers on Stack Overflow not to read. And this just works. And that, I think, is a, is a huge step, right? We, think, we know how much stuff has to be happening for that to happen. But for someone new, they don't care. They've just added a file. They know that they have to in include system, and then they just import stuff. But what if they want to do something else, right? What if they've, um, you know, I, I like GIFs, so there's this GIF search engine called Giphy, and let's say they have this URL, right, which um, it does a search. Now, it's pretty easy. You can type it in. You can look at this, and it's just full of GIFs like this, right? I really like this. Um, and let's say they want to take all of those results and play them on a page. Now, going off and fetching a JSON endpoint, there are a lot of different ways to do it, but the kind of new standard is to use the fetch API. And so JSPM will let you import anything from GitHub or NPM, just like this, and then you can use the fetch API, because it's not in the browsers yet. So I fetch that same URL, I pipe it into, and I ask for the JSON version of the response, please, and then I can console log the output. Right. And that's huge, right? Because now they've just taken something they've typed into our URL, and now they've got it programmatically. And the number of steps, so maybe they had to follow a tutorial for this or something. This is a bit more complexity here. But the next time they have a win is really soon. Right? So I'm just going to sort of jump ahead a little bit. It's pretty easy to skip through. Um, console log out the the URL so you know that you've got the right ones. And then if you've just learned about the how to create images and insert them into the DOM, this is sort of first time coding, right? Um, there's not much code to do this. It's a pretty small task. But you've written your first kind of meaningful little program. And then all the GIFs are on the page. And some of these GIFs are really good, actually. I really like this one. <laughs> um, and that, that's pretty good. But uh, like, at this point, we haven't really done anything special. We've just written slightly different syntax. But there's no like, meaningful, apart from pulling in a polyfill without having to do anything. But something that we would probably do at this point um, is now possible. We can refactor into another file. And being able to have a module system where it's just like, oh, cool, I've done something. I'm just going to put it in a file and name it something and give it an API, that isn't possible without all of these tools that we presuppose when we work day to day. Whereas now it is. It's just like another step. So if you're, say, helping a friend learn, you can teach them about how you know, convenient it can be once they've finished something to just put it somewhere and return something, export a function, and then use it. And that's uh, much earlier than they would otherwise be exposed to that lesson. Um, I make a few mistakes here in my screencast, so I'm just going to just jump forward a little bit. There we go. 
So now we have the same code, it's just as ugly, but it's off in one place. And if we probably, this is probably our two hours one day that we're learning web stuff, right? So we save the file and we leave it. But now, when we come back to this, we read this file and we start getting appreciation for some clarity in our code. And I actually want to talk about that a little bit more because um, if you've used or if you've seen code examples online, anything that's explaining how to use a library, often the code examples are not what we would write as professionals. But they're limited. Like they're usually one file with the data and the um, and the JavaScript just in line in the script tags. So I wanted to show a counterexample, and it, I, wanted, I want to propose what it would be like if this was the example instead. So this is pulling all the commits off a um, GitHub repository of mine and graphing them. And its main JS says that. It's three files, get stats, graphable stat, and display. It's fetch, transform, and visualize. Right? And if you're looking at it, you don't care. And this is all just, this all just run. Oh, if I've got the internet. Good on you. And we can experiment. This is a different way of, of you know, um, getting involved with code, interacting with code. Now here is the actual, this dimple library that we're using to graph. That's the code that you normally see in a demo, but it's conflated with data access and transformation. Um, and here we have the, you know, those two steps. So what I think JSPM could do, and for sites like Plunka, because you can have multiple files, is you can actually start giving people code demonstrations that are good code, clean code, so that that becomes the norm of the internet. And I don't think that's possible without JSPM. Oh, one more little thing. But this is only the start, right? Because if you're working as a professional, you're just hitting the CDN. It's, it's not a product. It's not just a tool for, for newcomers. Um, the, if you're going to run locally, you can download all the dependencies, much like NPM, basically. It, it it's effectively moves into a mode which is more like um, NPM and Browserify. So you use JPM, JSPM init, um, and then you change your index HTML here. Uh, to use a local version of system, you import a config file, and then you, um, you, you remove the tilde because now local files are the default. And so now we should get an error because we haven't downloaded our dependencies. And so this moves into the next mode of JSPM, which is now you're, you're declaring. You're not just randomly fetching whatever code you need. You're, you're moving into a point where you declare what you need. Uh, so we install fetch. Um, using this syntax, although there are you know, simpler versions as well. Um, and then we have to go ahead and we change our import to actually just use our local alias now. And so that's kind of what we, that's what we end up with. That's our code at the end of the project. It's a local server, um, and all the only network request it's actually hitting is the, is the data we need, much more like we would have done it um, if, we had, uh, if we'd done all the setup to begin with. And then it goes on, and you can do packaging and bundling. It's all production ready. So this might be what you're thinking at this point. It's like I've shown you a lot of the features about that first stage, about being friendly to newcomers. But is it powerful enough? Does it, does, is there a point where you have to tap out? And actually, three weeks ago, yes, there was. So I, I was working on a project called typeslab.com, uh, which is what all the slides here are, being, are using. Um, it's about 10 React components. But to load it. Uh, is because it has quite a few dependencies, um, uses 504 files. They all get loaded into the browser. And it takes about six seconds to load, uh, build the whole project, crawl the dependency graph. It does it every time you refresh. Um, it's fair to say that made me a bit sad because, I mean, one, I'm not a designer, and so the only way I can build anything that looks OK is being able to change each line of CSS and see if it makes it better or worse. Um, I find that actually not a bad way to get a reasonable result without having any you know, natural affinity for it. But the really bad thing is that all these tools that we're already using are better. Right? They don't take six seconds to change one file. And that's really bad, because it knew, I knew that that would mean I would use this project, and I would tell people to use this project until this point where it's like, OK, now you've got three dependencies, now you've got to switch to Webpack. And that I really don't like. So if there's one kind of quote 
that, that I want you to take away. It's that we should be aspiring to use the tools that we tell others to use. Otherwise, we tell them, you're not ready. Here's a toy you can play with. You won't hurt yourself. But when you're re ready to be serious, come talk to me. And so to do that, I think our tools need to gradually increase in power as a person becomes more familiar with them until they're all the way good enough for professionals to use every day. Which is why this talk is called Both Friendly and More Powerful. So I built uh, these things. And actually, I do have uh, a minute to show you. Um, I went away and I built things to fix this problem because I could figure out where it slots in. So let's see if I can do that. OK, so here, let me just show you what would happen normally. This is the previous workflow um, where if I wanted to be emphatic about whether this was TypeSlab or not, I hit Save, and it refreshes. And you can see 100, 200, 300, 400 requests, uh, 500 requests, six and a half seconds. Right? Um, doesn't matter what you're changing. Now, you also might see that there's four and a half meg transferred there, and you might think, oh, that's terrible for doing a website. Let me just show you um, online, um, the typeslab.com, the bundling, um, it all bundles down to um, 90K. Um, so it does have proper production ready. Like, you can, you can use this in the same way um, as anything else. But so this is what I built. And the actual the difference between running one and running the other is one is live server, and the other one is JSPM server. And that's the only thing you need to know when it's all finished. That's the only thing you'll need to know to be able to start using this new version. Right? One extra thing, one extra capability. And that just works. Doesn't matter what you're changing. It just works. And it's instantaneous. It's like a tenth or a hundredth of a second. It only works for those two files. Sorry, for those two types, for CSS and for JSX at the moment. But it can be extended to do anything. And to me, this stops that point where you would have to jump off and do something else. Oh, well, that was the demo. And that's, I mean, there wasn't a lot of work, right? And that's kind of what I want to tell you about, is because this was a tool. This is a whole ecosystem that has all of these properties and all this really nice stuff. And it got to a point where I would have needed to stop using it. But with not much work, I was able to extend that point. Right? And so now any React uh, project, I can use it for. And I'd like to do that for other languages as well. But it's also up to each of you to come up with uh, times where you can improve these things. So if you're coming across um, something that's quite powerful, but it's not very friendly, like bad readmes, um, bad error messages, um, bad tutorials, anything you can do, helping people when they ask questions in a nice way, um, like that will contribute to extending the, the, light, the usefulness of these tools out towards new people. And you can make the friendly tools more powerful. If you're, if you're involved in a, in a system, if you're using some software, and there's a point where it becomes not capable to do something, ask yourself, can you make it capable? So I'm going to finish with uh, a little discussion about why, why we'd even care. Because right? I kind of presupposed it at the beginning. Why do we care if anyone has a good experience learning to code? Why do we care if we get new people into the industry at all? I think uh, it was Damien yesterday who talked about some of the inherent problems we have in the industry. And you don't have to look far to see them. And don't get me wrong, we have deep cultural problems in the industry, and no technical solution is going to fix it. But I also hear a lot of people say it's far too complex to tackle. And they don't know what they can do to make it better. So why don't we start with something smaller? If we started taking pride in making our tools friendly, accessible, and welcoming, inclusive, then we would be responding to people friendly, a friend, in a friendly manner online. We'd be assuming people are enthusiastic, even if they're not knowledgeable. And as a result, we'd make ourselves and our industry um, friendly, accessible, welcoming, 
inclusive and more diverse as well. That's all I got. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? I know I've run a bit long, but... One at the back. Thanks. It was great. So maybe I missed it, but how did you improve it now, these 100 lines, right? Yeah, so I released um, three projects, and I've got a couple more in, uh, that, are, that are coming. Uh, so JSPM server is just a fork of a project called Live Server, which is a very simple local development server. Um, and then the way JSPM works is when you ask for a file, like a JSX file, it looks for a loader that can handle that. And so I wrote a loader that could be aware of asking for the same file multiple times and sw swapping one in and out. It's quite brittle. It only works with ES6 classes and single export defaults and stuff. But basically getting this um, uh, as the as the one true JSX loader for JSPM is the thing I'm working on now. Same thing for CSS. Ah, here. Thank you for your talk. I really appreciate the fact that uh, there is still someone looking at people who are just beginning. Great. Um, I'm in a way in this situation because I've been doing web development for a long time, but three years ago I quit and I'm doing something totally different now. Right. However, I would like to ask you, do you think, isn't it beneficial to teach people who are starting just the basics, so how to write a static file, just like you said in the beginning, yeah. instead of introducing yet another tool that they have to install somehow? Yeah. Because the old things, they still work in a new browser. They, they do. So I think that the shift between ES5 to ES6, and, and, and I think the, the biggest thing is being able to identify whether it's ES6 or ES5. Like being able to, you Google and you see ES6, you know some th things about it. You know that it's pretty recent. Um, and, it, and there are a lot of, there's just a lot of legacy out there for the older code. So if you start from ES6 as a baseline, I think you have a much better experience. And it's worth learning that you have to put that script tag in. Because really, that's the only difference in that first stage. You have your index HTML, and then you either use a script tag to include ES5 code, or you have a system, you include the system loader, and then you include your ES6. And so, um, the, yeah, it's that f very incremental increase in complexity, and it removes an uh, entire class of errors that you would be exposed to. And I think it's worth treating that as the new baseline. Thanks very much. <laughs> uh.